seated. All right, this morning we are continuing on through our um, journey through Ezra, and we are kind of, we kind of been taking it almost chapter by chapter by chapter in a full length of chapters. However, 8, 9, and 10, we're kind of, um, we're going to lump 9 and 10 together, and really um, a lot of what's going to be going on in 8, 9, and 10 of Ezra is a lot of just people's names and, and um, ancestry and where they're going and how they're getting there and whatnot. But this morning we're going to pay attention to Ezra 8, verses 21 through 32. Listen now to the word of God. There by the Ahava Canal I proclaimed a fast, so that we might humble ourselves before our God and ask him for a safe journey for us and our children. We, all, we with all our possessions. I was ashamed to ask the king for soldiers and horsemen to protect us from enemies on the road. Because we had told the king, the gracious hand of our God is on everyone who looks to him, but his great anger is against all who forsake him. So we fastened, we fasted and petitioned our God about this, and he answered our prayer. Then I set apart twelve of the leading priests, namely Sherebiah, Hashabiah, and ten of their brothers. And I weighed out to them the offering of silver and gold and the articles that the king, his advisors, his officials, and all Israel presented there, present there had donated for the house of our God. I weighed out to them 650 talents of silver, silver articles weighing 100 talents, 100 talents of gold, 20 bowls of gold valued at 1,000 derricks, and two fine articles of polished bronze, as precious as gold. I said to them, You as well as these articles are consecrated to the Lord. The silver and the gold are a freewill offering to the Lord, the God of your ancestors. Guard them carefully until you weigh them out in the chambers of the house of the Lord in Jerusalem, before the leading priests and the Levites and the family heads of Israel. Then the priests and the Levites received the silver and gold, and sacred articles that had been weighed out to be taken to the house of our God in Jerusalem. On the twelfth day of the first month, we set out from the Ahava Canal and to go to Jerusalem. The hand of our God was on us, and he protected us from the enemies and bandits along the way. So we arrived in Jerusalem, where we rested three days. This is the word of God. So a little bit of uh, kind of a, a, a preamble of what's going on. So Ezra, who we, who we met last week, and we kind of talked on what kind of man is, he is about to set out on his journey. So as we're, obviously Ezra is the author of this. So this is Ezra when he says, I, I, I. This is Ezra literally saying, I. Last year, um, I think it was about September, I took uh, about a week-long vacation, and I went on a hunting trip. And we went out to the Frank Church Wilderness in Idaho. So it's kind of in the, the boot of Idaho there. And when we got there, so a little bit about the Frank Church, it is 2.5 million acres, so it's a very vast, very um, big area. And with the Frank Church Wilderness, there's literally three roads that go into 2.5 million acres. So to prepare for this trip, I knew that there was going to be a lot of walking. I knew that many of the miles that we put on were going to be foot and horseback. So preparing for this trip, I'd prepared months and months ahead of time. I had to prepare myself physically. I had to prepare myself mentally and spiritually to go on to this trip. To even before we got in the vehicle, I had to be prepared for the trip. So as we got closer and closer to this trip, the preparations never ceased. Until that, that day that we got ready and everyone's anxious and it's a 17-hour drive out to the area and we pack up and there was more preparation. We had to decide not only where we would stay and how we would, um, which route we would take to get to this area, but there was more preparation before we even took off that morning. And as we got into the vehicle and we traveled 17 hours and we finally made it to the edge of the Frank Church and we met the guys that we were going with, then there was preparation on what things we would actually get on the mules and horses to actually get to the area. And then when we got to the area, we unpacked everything into wall tents. And then it was preparation on the things that we would take out that day. So as you can see, each day, each hour, each second was followed by steps of preparation for the next upcoming journey, the next upcoming moment. Now that's really not what this story is about. The story is about the lack of preparation. So on this um, trek, when we got to camp and I started to prepare things, well, we're high up. We're like 8,000, 9,000 feet up. 
So with that, you really don't know how the weather's going to change, how it's going to be from, from really hour to hour. So with me, I thought, well, i got to be smart. i got to prepare for this trip. I packed uh, my, my parka, and I packed extra socks, and I packed uh, extra long johns, and all these comfort items that were going to keep me warm once we got even higher up into our journey in the Frank Church. So with that, I throw it all in my day pack, and I get, I get everything ready to go. And we, we set out, and we, we get about three miles into this area, and we get off the horses, and we tie them up, and we get out and just start to hike. And you go from mountain to mountain, and you, you look around and, and whatnot. So we got about three miles into there, and um, it was probably about 55, 60 degrees, but it's all like a steep 7% gradual incline. So obviously, you're exerting a lot of energy. So with this, we, we took a break, and I reached into my pack, through the extra clothes, through the parka, through all my snacks and all my goodies that I had packed, because I like to eat, and it's going to be a long trip, so I have to have snacks. And way in the bottom of my pack was a single bottle of water. Now, we've been hiking three miles, and I had one liter of water with me. And I thought to myself, man, I've done all this preparation for this very moment, and yet I forgot to bring extra water. Here I was, three miles into the, to one of the most vast wildernesses in America today, with one bottle of water. Now this, this mistake wasn't because I was stupid or, or a lack of preparation. This wasn't because I didn't know what I was getting into, because we had researched, we went on hiking trips and trips um, similar to this one. I knew exactly what I was getting into. I knew that I had to bring water. I knew that water was probably the single most important thing along this trip. So was it because I failed to prepare? Because each step had its own preparation. So not really. I'd spent hours and hours and hours, even days, months, preparing and planning for my trip. But somewhere in the middle of that, somewhere in the midst of the chaos of planning, I simply forgot what was in store for me. I simply forgot what was going to be in the wilderness when I got there. How much energy I would um, waste going up and down side hills. How even though it was 55 degrees, how thirsty I would be. I would simply forgot this. The same thing happens in our walks with God. The same thing happens in our journey as Christians. We experience life. We've been taught many lessons. We've been told how to prepare for the journey. Many of us have known Christ for some time. For long times, in fact. We know the path we're heading on to. We know the journey. It's been set aside for us in Scripture exactly how it's going to turn out. We have read the Bible. We know the conditions. Yet, Somewhere in the midst of this, we stop seeing and we stop being thankful to God. We let the littlest things, such as a bottle of water, slip us by. When all of this happens, we look around us at what we can see. We look at the tangible aspects of our, our Christian faith, and all of a sudden, our worship becomes that. Our worship becomes focused on the tangible things, the things we can see, the things that provide us with comfort. Those are the things we think we need on our journey the most. Instead of the one thing that we are actually called to take on our journey. Maybe, maybe those things we look at, maybe, maybe we think in this life that we need to focus on the government. Because, you know, those are the people that are going to lead us. So we focus on the government, because we can see the government. We know, it. we think they're there every day. So it's a tangible thing that we begin to worship. Maybe, maybe it's the school systems. Our kids go to school every day, so we begin to worship. We begin to put our trust in the school systems, thinking, well, well that's what we really need on our journey. We need the schools. Maybe... Maybe for some of us, it's money. Money buys us our vehicles to get to church. Money fills those offering trays. Money buys us clothes so we're not all hanging out naked in church, right? So we begin to focus on tangible things, thinking that it will lead us on the journey with God. 
In our story today, Ezra is preparing for his journey. So Ezra has now got the commandments that he's going to go to Jerusalem. And he begins his preparation. He's getting ready for the trek. He's, he's at that first staging point on a journey that's going to take him, like I said in the kids' sermon, right around four months to get from, from Babylon to Jerusalem. It's about a four-month trek. And remember, this isn't like he's hopping in his SUV and driving up there, right? He's on probably camels, maybe some horses. And he has to take four months of supply with him because he has to eat and drink on the way. So it's not just as simple as packing up the car and driving. Ezra was told what was going on in Jerusalem. It wasn't like he was going to walk into Jerusalem and all of a sudden just get this big shock factor. Like we've been talking about for the last seven weeks, Jerusalem is literally in ruins. Sure, we, we built a temple, right? We got the temple up. That was the first priority. It took us 16, 17 years. So the temple's up. But all the structures around the temple, including the wall, is still left in ruins. Everyone's in, in poverty-stricken um, areas where their houses are, are like temporary shelters for the most part. So Ezra, he knew that he was going into to economic troubles. He knew that he was going into struggles emotionally, physically, and spiritually before he even set out on his trip. And Ezra also knew that he had to prepare himself for what he was about to face. So Ezra knew the first thing that he had to do in order to prepare for this trip was prepare himself mentally and spiritually. Ezra knew he had to prepare himself spiritually. Now, this is pretty much the opposite of, of what we do as humans. F for myself, if I, for example, I'm going on a trip this weekend or this week. The first thing I did to prepare for this trip was to prepare the physical things that I need. Example, I, I packed my bags. I did a checklist. I got the groceries I would need for, for this trip this week. See, for us, our human nature is to prepare the things that we can see first. Because we have sort of this, this mentality that we can, we can fix, that we can do the physical things. For, for the most part, as humans, or uh, specifically guides, we have this fix-it mentality in life. Like, like the leaky faucet at your house, that maybe it's just a really, really slow drip. So as guys, we think, ah, let's fix it. Or maybe it's that, that squeaky door that every time you open it, it kind of has this a mild squeak. So we, we think, let's fix it. Or our marriages. A as guys, we think, ah, maybe my wife's not as happy as she was yesterday. I'll fix it. But in all reality, the faucet wasn't that leaky. It was fine. In all reality, the squeaky door just needed a little WD-40, but instead we've ground it down to its original finish and restained it and put new hinges on for something that could have been fixed simply. In our marriages, we get this fix-it, need-to-do-it-now mentality. Well, let's face it, in all reality, we can't fix women. <laughs> so somewhere in the middle of this, we get this mentality that we can fix or do something without proper preparations. So in the middle of this, something gets us in trouble. Now, I've been in the fix-it mentality where I've been just covered in grease and mud, and it could have been something so simple. But for me, I immediately go past the preparation, past the, the prayer stage, the preparing ourselves mentally and spiritually, and right into let's get it done, let's fix this, let's do it. Now, if your marriage is, is like mine at all, um, my wife will come home from work, and, and she works with um, medical staff. If you work with medical staff, it's, it's a big cult, I think. And there's always some sort of issues, drama, problems. Maybe it's like any other. It's just Kim and I in here, so there's no drama or issues going on in this church. So maybe other workplaces are that way. But anyways, my wife comes home, and she always, um, she likes to, to vent to me of sort. And me and my fix-it mentality wants to fix it. So I offer her solutions, and I say, do this and do that. And somewhere in the middle, I get this look. Because in all reality, I can't fix it. In all reality, it just needs prayer. It just needs preparation. In all reality, I can't do it. It's something only that her and God can do. 
our reaction is just to get dirty, to get out there and do it. So Ezra, the very first thing he's going to do to prepare himself for a four-month journey is he's going to go down to the banks of the river and pray. And kind of the ironic piece about this is he's going to fast and pray. Now, along my journeys, along my treks, uh, the last thing I do before I go into a, a long hike or a hunting excursion is fast. In fact, I go on like a carb load, like eat everything in sight type thing because I want a lot of energy. I want a lot of food. But Ezra, it's kind of odd that he chooses to fast. He says, God, I'm just not going to eat anything so I can truly worship you, that I can truly focus on this relationship with you. Fasting is an aspect of humility. When we fast, it shows how much we truly, truly need what God provides us. So they seek, and they pray for God's guidance. And Ezra straight out comes out and says, I was too afraid to ask the government or, or the leadership to send us protection along the way. So God, I, I need you. So in this, Ezra is saying, his human nature maybe had made a mistake. But God, I, I really, really need you to help me out on this. As a church, how do we prepare ourselves for the journey set ahead to us? Do we wait until we're alone in the wilderness? Without that one thing, maybe a bottle of water, that we truly need to get through on this journey? As a church, do we set out in the wilderness without preparing ourselves spiritually, without preparing ourselves mentally, and when we get along the way, the one thing we need, God, we forget. See, in our walks, we let greed, lust, laziness, we let all those, those sins, those things of complacency set out before us. We see them as sin. We see them as obstacles to get in our way. But once we get there, we'll take care of that. No, we have to pray before the journey even starts for God's direction along the path. We have to prepare our journey for the little things. The little things that we know that God's going to bring into it. We have to, to take the things that make us comfortable, that make us warm and fuzzy and make us feel good, and say, no, the one thing I need along this journey is God. And we have to make sure that our packs are filled with as much God as we can bring on our journey. So the next thing that Ezra does, after he sits down at the banks and he prays and he prepares himself, the next thing he's going to focus on is material things. Now when he says he's going to focus on the material things, it's not so much the, the comfort items or the, the material things of the world. So Ezra spends three days fasting and, and preparing himself spiritually. The thing he does materially is he gets up and goes to work. He gets up, and immediately, as soon as he gets off his knees, he says, all right, I've prepared myself spiritually, let's go. And he immediately goes and sets out, and there's all this gold and silver. Now, I, I honestly, without doing a search through the books in my office, have no idea how much worth all this gold and silver is, but I know it is a lot, a lot of gold and silver. Now, this was the gold and silver, if you remember, that Nebuchadnezzar had stolen long, long ago, and he is bringing it back with him as part of this, this sacrifice to um, the, t the, the king's ruling this time. The reason why all of this, all these names that, if we would have started from Ezra, 1, or, um, Ezra 8, 1, the reason why all these names and all these this amounts of money are in this, because this is very, very recorded data, down to the exact amount of money that was brought with them. So Ezra could have just said, all right, here's all this valuable things, all this gold and silver, beam me up, Scotty, let's go to Jerusalem. He could have just said, well, it'll get there, I'm not going to really worry. But no, Ezra was a good leader. He had prepared himself mentally and spiritually, so he knew in all reality he had to make a count, write down all of the things that sit in front of him. Because he was going to hand them out and say, all right, this person's in charge of bringing this and this and this. So when they got to Jerusalem, finally, everything was accounted for. 
That was good management of the material things in front of them. Now, in the church, Kurt and the other deacons every Sunday bring the money back and they count it. They don't just say, here, Kim, make a deposit. Because it's good management of material things, of the things that God is, has blessed us with. Now, this brings us up to a kind of a question. Should have Ezra waited for direction, waited for guidance from God before he set out on his trek? Ezra literally gets up from the banks of the river, goes over here, counts his money, and says, all right, let's roll. Because Ezra knew that he had to get to work. Did it go against God's will? Was it the will of God? What is even the will of God? See, Ezra underlines something very, very important that we forget about the will of God. The will of God isn't a mystery. It isn't something that I have in the safe in my office that's like, like the great big fireproof safe that you unlock and there on a little piece of paper that looks like a fortune cookie that reveals the will of God. It isn't that big of a mystery. The will of God is for us to get out and do God's work. So Ezra doesn't go against the will of God. He doesn't go and say, God, I, I don't care what your plan is. I'm just going to go do it. What Ezra is doing is saying, I have to get out and go do God's work. We look at the things he'd been praying for, the things we pray for as a church, the things that we ask God for. We say, do they help or do they hinder the will of God's mission? We know and understand the mission. Ezra knew that his mission was to get to Jerusalem, right? He knew that's what God was telling him to do. So why wait? He's prayed. He's fasted. He's prepared himself spiritually and mentally. He says, let's go to work. Let's do this. All that required a commitment. He said, God, I I'm committed. I know there's not soldiers coming with me. I know all these people aren't coming with me, but let's go. Let's do this. It means not making excuses. It means not waiting for the other leaders to say, all right, it's time to go. It just means, as Christians, sometimes we have to get up and say, all right, maybe, maybe we need a Sunday school teacher. Let's do it. Maybe, maybe we need someone to scoop the parking lot. Let's do it. It means maybe we need a team of people to go down to, to South America. Well, we don't have... 14 people who, who can preach? It means, I'm a servant of God, let's go and do it, and God will provide along the way. That's what Ezra is saying. He's saying, let's go. Let's start this four-month journey. We've prepared ourselves. God will be with us. He is a light and a lamp unto our feet, meaning he'll provide the way. He will light the path as we go. It means don't make any excuses at all. Just try your best for God. Now, I want to I want to go back into the wilderness that I was in. So there I was, miles away from camp with one bottle of water. And as I sat there, I, I, I could have sat down and waited. I could have sent my brother back to camp three miles to get me some more water. And this is no lie. As I'm like taking sips out of my one liter um, bottle of water, like my buddies that are with me are guzzling water, pouring it over their head, maybe washing their pits out. You know, just, just soaking in the water, because they had brought, I don't know, gallons of it. They had packed their pack full of it. And here I am sipping my water. I could have said, hey guys, give me some of that water, let me fill it up. But here they are, literally, maybe they did it just to rub it in, I don't know. Here they are, drinking their water, having a good old time. And I pressed on. I went deeper into the wilderness. Now, now part of you would say, well, that's kind of stupid. But there's two things that I learned along the way. One, God will provide. I knew that if I used my water sparingly, I would get to somewhere. And the other thing, God provided me with knowledge that, that every hill goes downhill. And if I walk downhill, it takes a lot less energy. And if you've been around mountains, what's at every valley? A stream, right? So I walked downhill. I found a stream. I filled up all their empty water bottles, and I hit back on the trail. That's the same thing with our walk. Sometimes it would be easy to sit around at the base of a mountain saying, all right, God, find me. I'm here. Pick me back up. Let's go back out there. But miracles, yeah, they happen. But God provides us with knowledge. 
He provides us with everything we need when we properly prepare. God will deliver. He promised Ezra that. He said, go out and on your trip, and I will deliver everything you need along the way. One thing, we just have to go deeper. Deeper into the wilderness, deeper in with God. And then that trust will become easy. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we put our trust upon you that that even in the darkest of wilderness, even in the, the deepest valleys, you are found. That somewhere in the midst of our walk, when we seem like we haven't prepared ourselves for the things thrown at us, that you will be there to guide us, to watch over us. That you will put your hand upon us and say, I am with you. Father God, I pray that as we we go out into a chaos of the world, to the things of life that that maybe are hurdles or obstacles in a journey, that you will be with us. That you will provide the solution to get through each and every one of those obstacles. I pray this in in your name. Amen.